Here we go. Taking a kill trip on Death Row. With the third mainline entry in No More Heroes set to tear the galaxy apart this week, I felt like it was a great synergistic algorithmic time to dive into the series as a whole with a cheeky retrospective. The origins of Grasshopper, the Sword Killer trilogy, and of course, the tender of the Garden of Madness himself, Goichi Suda51. So grab your bean katana and slip on your most embarrassing anime shirt because it's time to kill or be killed. After leaving human entertainment and the happy-go-lucky world of Fire Pro behind him, Goichi Suda started up his own indie game development studio called Grasshopper Manufacture, putting out niche releases like Flower Sun Rain, The Silver Case, and of course, their big breakout hit, Michigan Report from Hell. Uh, I mean, Killer7. The bizarrely stylish third-person rail shooter hybrid was a collaboration with Capcom's Shinji Mikami and, while embraced by hardcore fans, wasn't exactly a blockbuster success. What it did lead to, though, was other opportunities for Grasshopper, such as two licensed games based on anime properties published by our good friends down at Namkai Bando. This duo, Blood Plus One Last Kiss and Samurai Champloo Sidetracked, both released in 2006, kicked off Suda's fascination with fast-paced melee combat, so much so that he wanted to reiterate it further with a brand new IP. Since the Xbox 360 was the first HD console out of the gate and with Microsoft just throwing cash at any Japanese studio willing to support it, Suda's original plan was for this new game, dubbed Project Heroes, to be an exclusive. Unbound by a license, Heroes was designed to be a melting pot of everything Grasshopper had put out up to that point, cramming in all the references and cinematic aesthetics and flair that Killer7 had hinted at. And by this time, Suda had struck up a relationship with Yasuhiro Wada, the president of... Murabas Entertainment which had been fostered ever since both companies had teamed up on Contact for the DS at the start of 2006. WADA had been given early access to Nintendo's newest system, then known as the Revolution, and thought Suda would enjoy a quick peek. Seeing the odd but fascinating handheld remote was all it took, as it would be the perfect fit for the sword-swinging gameplay Suda had in mind. Thus, the Xbox version had its spleen slashed in two. Suda wanted to really dive in upon what was started in the Namco anime games, and would later go on to say that this trio, Blood, Sidetracked, and No More Heroes, made up the Sword Killer trilogy. But designing everything around the Wii Remote would require a lot of testing and experimentation, so the team put their all into it. They were focused on making this their most ambitious title yet, unshackled by the rails of Killer7 and aiming for the game to have worldwide appeal. At the same time though, Grasshopper knew not to over-design or stretch themselves out too thin. Yeah, this was going to be their first open world game, but they weren't aiming to overthrow Grand Theft Auto or anything. Boss fights, story, and combat were the priority, not scope or interactivity. The game was confined to the borders of the fictional California city of Santa Destroy, where our unlikely hero, Travis Touchdown, Boy. is wasting away in a local bar. Having just won a homemade beam katana legally distinct on an online auction, he bemoans his past in a drunken stupor when he's approached by one Sylvia Crystal. With alcohol running through his veins, he doesn't need much convincing by Sylvia to engage in fisticuffs outside with a mysterious stranger, a stranger who just so happens to be number 11 in the United Assassins Association rankings. Travis actually winds up killing him, which then sets him on a bloody path to becoming number one, with added encouragement by Sylvia, of course. Huh? Go any higher and I will kill you myself. This menagerie of maniacal killers includes... Girl. 
And finally, Welcome to my castle. Navigating your way through the barren, almost lifeless streets of Santa Destroy in your hunt for these bosses is an instantly sobering affair as you spend long stretches just commuting back and forth between soul-crushing jobs. How the streets of Santa Destroy were depicted and just how little there is to do in them has been defended by some as some type of meta-commentary by Suda, but let's be real here, this was Grasshopper's first attempt at an open world and they were not a big studio. But despite all the blood, sweat, and tears being put into the game, Suda still felt, in terms of combat, it was feeling, uh, a little limp. We found that attacking with only motion controls was exhausting, so that's when we added the use of the A button. We made about four or five iterations before we nailed the combat. Therefore, killing in No More Heroes has been described quite accurately, I think, as akin to working on a typewriter or keyboard, with big hits of the spacebar as the motion controlled exclamation points. This is what set the game apart from waggle centric action fare like everything you see here which was flooding the Wii at the time. Confident in his creation and leading up to its unventual unsheathing, Sudo would say more and more attention-grabbing things to try and get a cheap headline, which absolutely worked. He stated that No More Heroes was going to be more violent than Manhunt 2, the measuring stick at that time, which when you consider the amount of decapitations and dismemberments by Travis's hands is technically true. Moreover, when Yours Truly was testing the North American version of the game, I was tasked with typing up the ESRB checklists for all the violent acts contained therein, which included things like writing, boss character is cut in half by a giant buzzsaw, and the nipples continued to fire long after death. Fortunately, the tongue-in-cheek style in which these events are presented stopped No More Heroes from getting too dark or cruel. What was cruel, though, was despite Suda's protests, the European and Japanese versions of the game would need to be censored to ensure it could even be sold there, so the geysers of blood were replaced with coins and black ash. When No More Heroes hacked its way into stores in late 2007 in Japan and early 2008 for the rest of the world, its sense of humor, style, eclectic roster of bosses, and strangely captivating pro tag struck a chord with fans and reviewers alike, much like how Killer7 did. I'll admit you've got potential. If Challenge had a taste, you'd be quite delicious. Catch up later, okay? What? The music was also especially notable, as it was incredibly varied and catchy, containing a little bit of just about everything. On a personal level, this soundtrack also has one of my favorite pieces of music of all time, Shinobu's theme, Season of the Samurai. Now, don't get it twisted though, the city of Santa Destroy had its fair share of rough Ow. edges, with some still disliking motion controls, the empty open world, and the required job grinding in between ranking battles. That last one though, I will contend was totally done by design. This is hammered home whenever you talk to quest givers, who are always cutting promos about putting your nose to the grindstone, paying your dues, and other euphemisms for busting your ass. Suda and the team pulled from just about everything. Johnny Knoxville to El Topo, The Stranglers, Memento, Anime, Spaceballs, all wrapped up in a distinctive punk rock style. I wanted Travis to be like a big schoolboy who sometimes jokes around and is sometimes deeply serious and who loves to fight. Travis is a little similar to me. If I had been an American otaku, what kind of life would I have led? Of course, I would have been a top ranked assassin. He's a very human character and one that fits within an action game. Even with that said, Suda at one point wasn't all that attached to Travis Touchdown. In fact, he was cool with letting the character be a one-off creation. As the project was wrapping up, the plan had been to kill off Travis by the game's end via Sylvia Crystal gunning him the fuck down. Cooler heads prevailed in the end, obviously, which is not typical for Grasshopper as they rarely make sequels, but I guess they decided to make an exception for Mr. Touchdown. 
Remember, Suda loves killing off his protags. Even in blood, he had wanted to kill Saya, or a clone of hers, to shock the player, but this was uh, rebuffed enthusiastically by the Namco employee who was overseeing that particular game. So it was kind of always a 50-50 chance that Travis could befall a similar fate. But it's a good thing he didn't. While sales of No More Heroes in Japan were you know, embarrassingly low, the same couldn't be said for the rest of the world. It managed to carve out a nice niche in both Europe and North America, and while exact lifetime numbers are not known, the original Wii version sits in the neighborhood of around half a million copies sold, which up until then was Grasshopper's biggest success. Travis also started becoming a sort of, a mascot's too strong a word, a spokesperson for the Wii and sort of fit in a weird way with the machine's unconventional style. The game sold better than its North American publisher, Ubisoft, was probably expecting. And once Grasshopper received the good news that the West liked Assassins, Beam Katanas, and Cats, a sequel was immediately greenlit. No more heroes. Travis Touchdown was going to return, not for fame, money, or even Nookie, but for revenge. 2010's No More Heroes 2 Desperate Struggle was, in the strictest sense, a direct follow-up, taking place two years after the original and adhering to much the same formula. While the graphics, combat controls, and grinding nature of the side jobs were either fixed or improved, the game's boss fights, level design, overall length, and story all took a few steps back. Suda, busy with just having co-directed Fatal Frame 4, as well as still writing and producing Shadows of the Damned, took a back seat on Desperate Struggle and slid into an executive director role, while Nobutaka Ichiki stepped in as the primary. The biggest change to the game was not improving the open world concept of Santa Destroy, but eliminating it altogether, simplifying it to just a list of locations that you choose from a menu. I get that it was the most divisive part of the first game, but I I would have liked to have seen Grasshopper fleshing it out rather than just cutting it. In addition, the need for Travis to earn enough scratch to advance to each boss was also overhauled, instead letting the player take on each assassin as soon as they liked. Any money you did earn from the new 8-bit retro minigames would exclusively go towards buying clothes and pumping up Travis's stats. While you could take on bosses without these boosts, it's not exactly recommended. The story, such as it is, sees Travis wanting to exact vengeance on whoever killed Bishop. That's not a spoiler, but this act was done to get revengeance on Travis in the first place for something he did and anyway, with Santa Destroy having gone through a resurgence in the last Last couple of years and with no solid leads, Travis just happens to bump into Sylvia, who then sets up a series of fights against 51 other assassins who somehow leapfrogged over Travis in the rankings despite never beating him. Oh, and the number one ranked killer is also the person that had Bishop killed. Again, not a spoiler. That's the basic story setup, and it's not all that concerned with making any sense. The tone is far more serious this time around, but we'll still dip into straight-up comedy at random intervals, which makes things feel uneven compared to the first game. I can't exactly explain why, but Suda cited the film Battles Without Honor and Humanity Deadly Fight in Hiroshima as a direct influence on Desperate Struggle's narrative, and while certainly you know, not bad, the tale presented here just isn't as memorable as the first game. In fact, even though it tries really hard, almost everything about No More Heroes 2 doesn't quite reach the heights of its predecessor, in my opinion. For example, the OST as a whole, while still very good, doesn't have as many bangers. The bosses, which are light years beyond those in a lot of other games, get less screen time and backstory this time around. And while it's certainly quick to navigate a menu, not being able to explore Santa Destroy in a more fleshed out way was a bit of a disappointment to a lot of fans. 
The combat, though, feels much more polished and flows a lot better, being able to choose between various beam katanas on the fly, while incredibly slow, is a nice upgrade. And the retro-style minigames are all good fun, except for tile and style, of course. It's a game of one step forward, about half a step back, which is weirdly accurate, as both games reviewed almost identically. Despite all that, I own the Japanese Hopper Edition, which is the centerpiece of my No More Heroes collection. Thank you very much. By 2010, though, the Wii craze was slowing down, way down, with many third-party titles selling far worse than the milk and honey days of 2006 to 2008. So it's not a surprise that Desperate Struggle sold a fraction of what the first game did, even in the West. While a lot of factors certainly contributed to this, No More Heroes 2 did miss out on a big opportunity by getting bumped off Ubisoft's big E3 2009 stage show. An elaborate trailer featuring Suda51 himself had been filmed, but since the presentation by James I'm Gonna Ramble for 25 Minutes About Blue Cat People Cameron dragged on, Desperate Struggle's big moment never happened. The trailer in question was posted online without much mainstream fanfare later that E3 week. Moving on, the very next year, another wrinkle in the No More Heroes timeline occurred. While not confirmed, it's probable that Marvelous Entertainment was worried about the sequel's performance, so to remedy that, they farmed out ports of No More Heroes 1 for both the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 in Japan. Why they even bothered with the 360 over there is anyone's guess, but these versions, well, they were a bit confusing. Heroes Paradise, both released in Japan, had some new content. HD visuals, a few quality of life improvements, pointless DLC, a model viewer, extra bugs, and finally, poorer frame rates. Heroes Paradise was developed by Feel Plus, makers of Jew on the Grudge, and did not involve Suda or the original creative team in any significant capacity. If you'd like me to spill a bit of tea here, Grasshopper in general, and Suda specifically, didn't seem to be too enthusiastic about these ports, as they seemed to be a pure business decision on Marvelous's part. Then, Konami, of all companies, stepped in to publish just the PS3 version for the West, as I'm assuming Ubisoft had long stopped caring about the franchise. This version, also called Heroes Paradise, was set to receive even more content. Added minigames, cobbled together from existing assets, <laughs> move support, online leaderboards, and five bosses from No More Heroes 2 shoehorned in as bonus cage matches. Since they were never designed for this game, they just happen every so often and lack any sort of context or cutscenes explaining their presence. Now, again, Konami didn't even bother to release the Xbox 360 version overseas, even though it was fully completed and just sitting there. Why is this? Well... By having the PlayStation Move controller, it's much easier to keep the interaction true to the original, so going to the PS3 was a pretty natural choice. We have, and are still, tossing around ideas for linking No More Heroes with the Kinect for Xbox 360 gamers, but since the Kinect is such a unique device, it's a bit more difficult. This isn't to say that the Kinect is a poor interface by any means, citation needed, but more that in its uniqueness, it requires a bit more care and planning to bring Travis to the Xbox 360, so if we were to do so, we need more time, which I guess they never got. Moreover, the PlayStation 3 version had DualShock 3 compatibility, so there was literally no reason not just to do a quick port of the 360 version for other territories, but this is Konami I'm, I'm talking about here. You try to make sense of their 2011 madness. The North American PS3 version was then re-released in Japan under the Red Zone moniker and put back in the blood and gore that had always eluded the franchise in its home country. You're a junkie for blood, old man. While technically the game's a messy hodgepodge and the new content is pretty lackluster, Field Plus did add in a few smart tweaks, like being able to stock special moves and go dumpster diving from the seat of Travis's bike. At the end of the day though, Heroes Paradise is generally seen by the No More Heroes community as an oddity that wasn't approved by the original creative team and most hardcore fans of the Wii original stayed away. 
While I, again, can't find exact lifetime numbers, reportedly neither the PS3 nor Xbox 360 version sold well in any country, so much so that they didn't even bother with HD ports of No More Heroes 2. Okay, while I've used the word obscure a few times now, nothing out obscures our next game. No More Heroes World Ranker for Android and iOS was a 2012 mobile game where players could create their own assassin to rise through the ranks. It featured touchscreen only controls, multiplayer and social elements, and reused a ton of assets from the first two games. Honestly, I have to say there's something about this that has a concrete appeal, but unfortunately the rest of the world was denied World Ranker, as it never saw a release outside Japan. The only playable piece of the No More Heroes universe I have yet to touch. Following the muted response of Desperate Struggle, Grasshopper Manufacture started to focus on other projects, and Mr. 51 shifted to more of a business-slash-producing style role. There's Killer is Dead, Shadows of the Damned, and Lollipop Chainsaw, which, if you forgot, was adapted into English by James Gunn and sold well over a million copies and became, at that time, Grasshopper's biggest moneymaker. It's pretty apparent that Travis helped inspire these new heroes, kooky badasses with a penchant for wisecracks and making things dead. All of these new titles had something in common though. None of them were actually directed by Goichi Suda, who aside from a few outliers seemed to have stepped away to give more room to up and coming grasshoppers. A great example of this was Let It Die, which went for a very different business model and structure, and while it was a big risk for the company, it seems to have done pretty well all told. During this decade of experimentation since Desperate Struggle though, Suda started hearing pleas from fans all over the world, myself included, to have Travis Touchdown pick up the Beam Katana once again. While the ending of, of No More Heroes 2 was pretty extremely vague, Suda had always dropped hints that he would like to continue telling stories in Santa Destroy, even if it meant focusing on a new assassin. This plan never really seemed to come together though, that is until Nintendo unveiled the Switch and started to once again print money. I think Suda was probably right to wait, as the Wii U, outside of Nintendo's own offerings, wasn't exactly the best venue for anything really. However, with the low sales of No More Heroes 2 still in the back of their minds, there was a bit of trepidation in how to approach a new entry in the franchise. With the meteoric rise of indie gaming during Travis's 10-year hiatus, Suda and Grasshopper went for a different approach. Enter Travis Strikes Again, No More Heroes. Our favorite otaku loser was off the grid, living the trailer life in the wilds of Texas and spending his days playing the legendary underground video game console, The Death Drive Mark II. Conversely, Badman, the father of No More Hero 1's bad girl, is coerced by Dan Smith of the Smith Syndicate to assassinate Travis and grants him a mysterious object called a death ball to aid him in this undertaking. Tracking him down, Badman ambushes Travis in his trailer, but the Death Drive reacts to the Death Ball, sucking them both into the inner workings of the machine. If they can fight their way out of each game, the Death Drive will grant them one single wish, which will hopefully let the dreams come true! <laughs> Travis Strikes Again is weird, there's uh, no way around it, as it's laser focused on telling a bizarre level based story that also feels oddly personal. It plays quite differently too, more of a wave based beat em up platformer that's best enjoyed while playing co-op with a buddy assassin. While it may seem like a side story, it actually advances the overall plot in some significant ways, and if you're a fan of Grasshopper, it is absolutely required playing. Originally though, TSA was going to be more ambitious while still retaining the tighter design and indie feel. Instead of wholly original Death Drive game worlds, Travis was going to jump to other game franchises, literally, such as Shovel Knight and Hotline Miami just to name a few. Even though Suda really wanted to make this work, having to go back and forth with a bunch of different studios through language barriers and time zones presented some clear logistical complications that would hamper progress. So Grasshopper did what they tended to do, pairing things back in an effort to remain focused and not to overstretch themselves. 
And in the end, the t-shirt collaborations are still pretty charming. Even with that sudden decision, Suda was still able to get some other game worlds in there. If you've played TSA, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. And while not every original theme they came up with is a winner, fuck off coffee and donuts, the inclusion of visual novel elements which harken back to Grasshopper's earlier days more than make up for this. These are so fun and so sharply written that I tended to look forward to them more than the action stages. It even came with expansions that featured two fan favorites as playable characters, and while the whole package isn't exactly what some people wanted, it still felt really good to have Torabisu touch it down striking once again. Thankfully, due to the pre-orders and eventual sales success of TSA for both the physical and digital versions, a first for the series, No More Heroes 3 was officially greenlit. It's taken over 10 years, constant fan outcry, and just the right timing for this to happen. And having experienced a bit of the game myself already, I think it's been well worth the wait. Not only that, the recent remasters for Switch and Steam are excellent options if you're looking to go back to them, are appropriately priced, and stay true to Grasshopper's original vision. This is a series that means a lot to me. It's a reverent humor, unique world, larger than life characters, and distinctive style make for such an intoxicating fluid that just, someone please just hose me down with it. I want it, I need it. Uh, Travis, you know, he, he was even in, well, bits of him were in Dragon's Dogma and he's in Smash, you know, kinda. So on a personal level here, it's been such a thrill to have seen this franchise evolve ever since I first got to work on it, even in a very small capacity all the way back in 2007. I hope you're all equally as geared up to return to the streets of Santa Destroy, so thanks again for taking the time to watch this retrospective. And for those of you out there who have yet to experience the series, just press the button on your controller of choice. Let the bloodshed begin.